Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Lee Mangold. Um, I'll kind of give you a little bit about my background before we get going. Uh, I am the, I have a small business myself. Uh, we started in Winter Park about two years ago. We now have offices in three different states. We're doing cybersecurity consulting, um, specifically and only for small, mid-sized business. So we measure the size of a business. Anyone who's done IT can kind of appreciate this, but anyone who's, where we look at the measure of a, of a small business as how many employees they have. More people, more machines, that's what drives complexity for us. So that's, that's really who I work with. Um, my smallest client is a two-person law firm, and the largest is a 350-person um, uh, industrial, I don't even know how to classify them, anyways. They pay me a lot, but I don't know how to classify them. Um, so I have a nonprofit, the Florida Cyber Alliance. So we do a lot of education and outreach for, uh, in groups like this. We do summer camps, cybersecurity summer camps for high school students. Um, if anybody's interested, if you have a high school student or you know someone who is interested, send them that way. Uh, the camp is actually free. So um, I am the president of the Central Florida Information Systems Security Association. If you are in IT or security, or if this just interests you in general, look up Central Florida ISSA. Um, great organization, a lot of opportunity to learn. Um, we have, in that chapter, we do at least one event every single month. Um, security B-sides. How many people have heard of B-sides? A couple people? So B-sides is this community-driven sort of hacker conference. There are B-sides organizations and conferences across the country, and we have ours coming up this year in Orlando again. Um, it's to be out at Full Sail, I want to say April 9th. That's what I want to say. But um, I believe the tickets are 20 25 bucks, something like that. Very, very fun, a very accepting community, and you'll learn a lot of the, uh, the nitty-gritty details that you may not want to know uh, at a B-Sides event. And I also teach out at UCF. I teach a, a cybersecurity class out there, um, which we teach a lot of the same materials you're going to see today. So, so this is broken into three sections. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through all the three sections, and we're going to take a little break in the middle. So I'll do some slides, we'll do some questions, and we'll take a break. Um, and then we'll come back, and we'll do that throughout the rest of the day. Um, so let's get started. So this is, this is the chart I was telling you about. right? So these are the trends that we're seeing going on across the industry. Uh, that shouldn't surprise anyone. If that was a revenue chart, that'd be great. right? Unfortunately, it's not. It's incidents of, of hacking. Um, again, like I had mentioned uh, before, we, before we started, uh, this is subject to only the data that you can actually get your hands on. So when, nobody, when you don't report a breach, when you don't report an issue, of course, it's not going to show up in a chart somewhere. Um, you know, who are the attackers? Lots of different organizations. So we, have, we see attacks from uh, organized crime organizations, large organized crime syndicates that exist for the purposes of stealing and, stealing and reselling information. Um, there are, they've broken up a lot of these, uh, what are called Carter rings, so they're organized criminal networks uh, that they try to steal your credit card information. They take your card information, they program it on another card, and then they start charging on it. Or they go to ATMs and they pull out cash. Um, there was a big one that got broken up probably about three years ago now. And it's one of my favorite, and I don't have the picture in here, but one of the things that really got them caught was this guy in New York City, they're going ATM to ATM, just putting in cards and withdrawing daily maximum off people's bank accounts. Um, until the ATM runs out of money. Well, he took a picture of himself, publicly posted it on Facebook with all the cards and a big stack of cash in his, in his, in his lap. So, good times. But those, those organizations exist, and usually they're a little bit smarter than him. Um, state-sponsored attackers uh, in government, we see this a lot. Right now, whether it's state-sponsored or it's not, that becomes an attribution issue. Um, and we are very hesitant to attribute anything to anyone, usually. Um, we, we do see a lot. The script kiddies or other professionals, um, these are people who are generally just downloading stuff online and saying, hey, I wonder if I can use this hacker tool and see if it works, right? Unfortunately, they have a very high success rate. And for a lot of reasons that we'll talk about, they don't have to know what they're doing. They just download a tool. There are actually services out now where you can essentially do hacking as a service. So if you want to send out ransomware, you don't have to set up all your own stuff. 
you can pay a service to custom create ransomware products for you, and they will send it out for you. And you just give them the information on who's, who you're sending it to and all that kind of stuff, and you let them build up your, your Bitcoin, right? Um, and then the hacktivists, so usually you, you can, these are broad categories, usually you can lump a lot of these together, um, but hacktivists are organizations like Anonymous, um, and so on, so, uh, or uh, LulzSec and all these that have been responsible for a lot of uh, uh, interesting attacks. The little chart on the right uh, is, is kind of interesting, it's a little bit dated, um, but the blue is all external based attacks, and the yellow up top is internal, and what we're seeing now is the internal attacks, or the partner attacks also, are increasing. And by that I mean these are your own employees that are doing things. These are, and we're talking internal, and that could be accidental too, by the way. Um, or the partner-based attacks, if you work with a third-party company, and that third party has lost your data, it was still your data and you trusted that third party, right? We're seeing that increase a lot. And we, that's where we really talk a lot about software development and staying out of, out of that third party, right? Yeah, yeah, and we're gonna, in, in the first section we're gonna do the basics. The second section we actually, is the whole section is devoted to case study. So we're gonna talk about a lot of these breaches um, in some detail. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of fun because we're gonna show it's not, just the, it's not just the big cases that you hear about, right? Um, but even the big cases, they weren't very sophisticated. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So, um, top threats and targets. So, medical, legal, financial, and, and retail are still huge targets of attack. We're seeing that continuously. But really the biggest threats that we're seeing out there, malware, uh, social engineering, and uh, third-party data theft, so that's your third party again. Um, interestingly, I, before we had started, some of you walked in and saw me on my laptop, I was literally replying to two clients that both had a successful phishing attack, just this morning, where somebody phished them, uh, one person gave out their credentials to another site over email, and the other person uh, wired money based on an email that was spoofed. Uh, I think they caught it quick enough so they could, they could shut it down, but these things happen. These were very small businesses, by the way. One's a tech company, um, and one's a, a uh, law firm. So this is happening. This is, we are beyond the point where, uh, we, used to, we used to love this excuse, we didn't, um, where we could say, uh, you know, I'm too small. Why would anybody come after me? What do they want from me? Everyone has something that somebody wants. So, and you know what? You may not have a lot of that something, but I can combine yours with others and I can sell it, right? That's what they're doing in large part. So I wanna kinda take you back a little bit. Does anybody know what this is? I've heard a lot of, a lot of guesses, but most people, this is the, this is the general response, right? <coughs> this was the internet in 1977. Now, this wasn't the internet in 1977 in that these little boxes represent a state or a country. Those boxes, our computers. That was the entirety of the internet. Um, it was ARPANET at the time. Um, ARPANET became DARPANET, then ARPANET, and then back to DARPANET, I think, I don't know. Um, government stuff, right? Um, but you'll see a lot of names up there that, that you recognize. The interesting thing with this is in kind of how the internet grew and how it became to what it is today and how it became so complex. This was all created um, for the purposes of data sharing. How do universities, how do government, how do we share massive amounts of data between each other, right? You notice I didn't say this is for uh, sharing securely, it's just how do we share it? So these uh, standard protocols were created and the way it grew was if you can physically connect to the network and you can speak over the same, these same protocols, you too can join this network. And it was brilliant and that's how they did all this, that's how the internet grew into what it is today. Um, it's a little bit bigger than this now, as you can imagine. Um, internet eventually uh, broke off into uh, two sections, one that was retained by, uh, by the Department of Defense or the US government, and the other one that split off and I believe is managed by uh, IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, I believe, and that's the public internet that we're familiar with. So, but this is kind of what those boxes were at the time. 
right? So if you think 1977, and then you think in the, in the span of how far we've come over a very, very short period of time, this has not been that long of a period of time. Now, I'll give this presentation to high school kids, right? And they'll be like, what's that tape thing? They don't, they don't, I take it back. They don't know what the tape thing is. They say, what's that round thing, right? Um, but it really, our, our uh, technology has exploded uh, to the point where, in a lot of cases, it grew way too fast, and we have lost control of a lot of, of, of that growth. So uh, one of the things that I like to, to tell people, I like to show people, right, this seems crazy simple. But this is, very seriously, one of the, <laughs> this is the foundation of really every assessment that we do. It's the foundation of every organization we talk to. These are the really, really, funny enough, the really hard questions that they have to answer, right? So first of all, knowing what data is important to you, right? What is, what is your critical data? What is your sensitive data? And if your answer is everything, then that's not really the right answer, right? Because the second part comes in and says, well, where is your critical data? Right. So how many people use a, um, a cloud service for like file storage? So being Dropbox, OneDrive, Box.com, things like that. We do too. It's not, it's not a trick question. You can, you can raise your hand. Um, so when I ask people, you know, where, is all of your, where are all of your files kept? They'll usually say, well, we keep them all in Dropbox or they're all in OneDrive, right? But it's really easy to forget that these services also allow desktop syncing. So it's not just there, it's also downloaded to your computer at home. It's downloaded to your laptop, it may be on your phone if you have the app, maybe your employees have synced, and now they have physical copies of those files. What happens when that employee leaves? Where's your data, right? How do you get rid of a laptop when it's no longer, it's end of life? Do you take the hard drive out and, and drill holes through it? Right? Or do you say, oh, I, I trust somebody else to get rid of it? Right? A lot of those questions. So figuring out, number one, what is important and figuring out where it is is actually surprisingly difficult. Um, the big one that people, very interestingly, they, they often overlook is email. Your email has some of the most important information about your organization than, than anything else. If you um, are in you know, legal services, or real estate, right, um, or, or any of these other organizations, or any of those kind of industries, when you receive massive amounts of PDF files, right, and those PDF files are usually a scan of somebody's credit card number that you bill or something like that, um, or you get an email that says, here's my account number to uh, transfer the escrow, or here is, you know, all that kind of stuff, that's all in your email. Well, if you're doing a really, really good job protecting your files on where they're stored, but not on protecting your email, right? All somebody has to do is get to your email because chances are the data went there first. It's just, unfortunately, email is, that's just how it, how it works, right? So understanding what, where, and how it's protected, right? How it's protected is, is an interesting problem, right? Because that's when we're talking about risk management that'll be in the, sec the third part. We're talking about risk management and compliance and how you get your hands around the scope of this, right? Uh, a lot of the controls we're gonna talk about, a lot of the very specific stuff we'll talk about, applies not just to one machine or one computer or to one process, it applies to everything. And that's where it gets difficult. That's where you have to start thinking in terms of how do I make a repeatable process that I can scale with my organization, right? So, yeah, so this is my little illustration. You can tell I'm a professional artist, no I'm not. Um, so this is kind of the idea of what has happened to data, right? So initially you started, um, oh, you guys got the cheat sheet. So initially we had started with the data, you know, it, it's all in one little network, it's all in your one building, right? So where's your data? Well, it's, it's right there, right? It's like a file cabinet. And then we said, well, we can do this wide area networking thing. Now we've got it in two places. Okay, but we still have a similar problem, where we still have a similar case where it's, it's all in that big file cabinet. And then everyone decided that man, the way I would really like to spend my nights and weekends is working, so, so let's create these mobile devices. Let's do stuff on the run. So now, where is your data? 
Right now it's on all these devices. Who knows where they are, right? Well, how do those devices work? How do they connect to each other? Radio signals, right? <coughs> through Wi-Fi, through Bluetooth, uh, near-field communications, which is like the tap-to-pay stuff, um, AMP Plus, which is another uh, uh, standard out there. And those are just the consumer, you know, the ones we're most familiar with. There's also, of course, your cell phone. And there's five, your cell phone usually is able to negotiate like five or six different types of uh, data connections on your behalf, right? That's when you see it goes uh, LTE to Edge to 4G to 3G. If that happens, you're, you're in a place where you don't want to be. But um, so, so we're starting to, to see now the whole problem of where is our data start to spread out. So let's add some complication to it. Let's put it in one place in the cloud. So there's a lot of ways to, to talk about what is the cloud and stuff like that, but largely the cloud is somebody else's data center. They've usually put some nice interfaces in front of stuff for you, but when you upload stuff to Dropbox, it goes through a web interface and it sits on somebody's file server in some other organization. The, how many people have pulled the security information on Dropbox? Yeah, really no one has, right? We assume they're secure. Dropbox had some hiccups in the past. They've, they've kind of gotten their act together. Um, but we assume these third parties are secure without really, in a lot of cases, knowing what we're looking for. So let's take that a step further. How many people have heard of Internet of Things? Internet of Things, this idea where everything on the planet should have an IP address for some reason. Um, in some cases, it's really cool, like the Nest thermostats, right? Put your thermostat on and you can track your AC usage over time. Um, and then you have issues where, for whatever reason, uh, somebody has decided that Wi-Fi toasters are something really cool that we should have, so those exist. I don't know why, but they do exist. Um, and we've created this massive amount of complication in the network, right? And then we go into critical infrastructure. By the way, that's what all power plants look like. No, it's not. Um, but, and you would like to think that all of these power plants or all these, you know, uh, uh, the SCADA facilities, so it's a lot of these uh, uh, wind turbine facilities, uh, energy generation, water, uh, water sanit uh, purification, uh, E911 systems, traffic light systems, you would like to think that those things are not on the open internet. As I like to tell people, there's a lot of things I would like to think, and then there's the reality. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these systems are on the internet. And there's, there have been issues with that, but there are search engines out there that specifically look for open uh, you know, municipal connections. Uh, the bunch of ones I've seen are uh, the hydroelectric plant that we found in France, actually, uh, wide open. And you can literally get in there, it's the control panel. You can get in there and start moving knobs. Yeah, pretty scary, no password, wide open on the internet. Um, a lot of people have uh, camera systems. Uh, that's the biggest one. You put a camera on the internet and you don't change the username or password because admin admin seems really easy, so why should I change it, right? Um, there was a bunch of, there's a bunch of funny cases of how people have used that for just to mess with people. Um, but, you know, there's somebody watching security cam footage of a security guard watching security cam footage. It's kind of a funny thing to see. Um, and then they call them and they, you know, say, all right, uh, you know, so start, uh, this was, I think it was like Pizza Hut or one of the pizza chains, whatever. They found, a, some hackers found one of the cameras they got onto it with, with either no credentials or with uh, 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 the, the default admin credentials. And they started calling the pizza store and getting them to do things like, all right, now jump up and down. You're not jumping up and down. You're, you're still not jumping it. There you go, right, and messing with them. Um, it, was, it was actually, it, it's funny, it's also kind of scary. Because now you got to think, well, I've got a security cam out in the front door. Has anyone done anything other than plug it in, right? A lot of times, no, unfortunately they haven't. So these problems continue to get, make the internet more and more complicated. Anytime I can use this slide is a good day for me. So 
you'll notice that it also tiles, which is amazing. This is the most exciting thing about the presentation for me, guys. I'm sorry. But because it actually works, you can follow the balls. But anyways, well, this is what we end up creating. So we started from that nice little network diagram, and we went to our own little home office kind of thing to this idea where data is flying everywhere. It's flying through all these different cloud services. Um, you know, we, we have no idea what data is going across our networks. When you go into, I used to love this uh, for one of the consulting companies I, I used to work for a while back. We go in and we ask them, you know, do you use any cloud services? And they say, no, we don't allow cloud services. Are you sure? It's like, yeah, no, we, we block them. They didn't block them. Um, and you go and you look and you run network tests and you run some network capture and you find, well, so iTunes is running, iTunes Cloud. And uh, by the way, you've got half your workforce uh, on YouTube right now, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, all this, has, you find all these things. And I think it was on average, something like, there are companies that actually sell products for that stuff. And their, their number, something like the average organization uses somewhere between 70 and 80 cloud services. Most of them don't even know it. Right? You could say, no, you're not going to use it. You, can't, you are not allowed to use Google Drive. But we use Google for email. But just don't use Drive. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you how long that lasts. So kind of types of attacks. Kind of dive into this a little bit more, get a little more tactical on some of this. Malware. Um, this is one of the biggest things we're seeing right now. Uh, if you've heard of uh, ransomware uh, or crypto lockers or things like that, these will, um, these, these will not be, these will not make your day very friendly. Uh, so if you've, anyone heard of, who's heard of ransomware? Cryptolog? Okay. So for those who haven't, um, imagine going to your computer. All your files are encrypted. You can't do anything other than look at this big warning on your screen that tells you you have three days to pay me in Bitcoin to get a key back so we can unlock all the stuff on your computer. Now imagine having an organization with 300 computers and then finding out that that ransomware knows how to spread across your network. Well, 300 computers times however much they want in ransom, usually 600 to $1,000, that becomes a rather large bill. There went your IT budget, by the way. Um, it becomes a pretty large bill. So we're seeing that a lot. Not only that, but we're also seeing a lot in um, what are called uh, crypto miners. So uh, people will, you know, when you try to do this, the ransomware thing, a lot of people have realized that if I get ransomware, I've got all my stuff backed up anyways, I'll just restore it. A lot of companies do that. They store all their stuff online. If it gets hit, they take the computer out of service, give you a new one, and it puts all your stuff back. No big deal. So they start doing these uh, mining services. So they'll compromise a machine. They'll try to spread just like everything else. And rather than encrypt all your files, they start running Bitcoin miners or Ethereum coin miners. And you are... They are using your power bill and your resources to make them money. Um, I had an organization, uh, one of my clients, uh, about 350 to 400, somewhere on their uh, machines on the network, 100% malware infection, all with uh, these, these minor softwares. Um, I'm sure they made, you know, the attackers made some money off that. And that's legitimately what's going on. That's how these things happen. Um, botnets. Uh, is really kind of all plays into a lot of this other stuff. Uh, stealing of credentials is huge, and we're going to talk about that in a minute a little bit deeper. But if I can just get your credentials, I only need to just ask for credentials. I don't need to try to hack your systems. I don't need to try to, but if I can get a piece of malware on your system, or if I can even call you on the phone and say, what's your username and password, and you give it to me, well, I'm done, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in some of the case studies. One of, the, one of my favorite tricks, honestly, is you, you call up, and now this won't work anymore because you know, video and everything, um, but you know, call up and say, hey, this is Lee from IT. Are you having problems with your email? Every single person thinks they're having problems with their email. Your email could be working perfectly, and everyone thinks they're having problems with their email. Little IT thing. Um, I'm, I might be a bitter IT guy. I don't know. But uh, everyone thinks they're having problems with their email. Like, oh, yeah, I, I am. Like, okay, cool. So what's your username and password? Probably 80% of the time right over the phone, username and password. Once I have that, well, I don't really need much more. Do you have VPN? I'll just VPN into your network. Maybe I'll go through all those third-party services that you're using that you're probably using the same username and password on. Right? Easy stuff. We'll see a lot of that kind of come through malware. We'll see it mostly through phishing. Right? So 
and, and fishing is a lot more than kind of what this is, what you see here. Primarily what we're seeing in phishing now is they're looking for your credentials. They're looking for access to your email account. Because what they'll end up doing is they try to spread that way, they try to spoof you as a person. They will, this is, this is a little bit creepy, they will look through your emails, they will figure out who you talk to, how you talk to that person. Do you call them Mary or do you call them Mrs. Smith? They will you know, duplicate your, your signature block. They will do everything that look, make it look exactly like an email from you and they will send it from your email account and try to compromise other people. If you've got client information in your email, guess what they now have access to? If that's personally identifiable information, if it's healthcare information, please don't put healthcare information in your inbox. Um, if it's credit card information, whatever, you just had a data breach. All of that data is presumably could have been downloaded, could have been stolen, right? So phishing is sort of that way of I want to get you to click on something to get down or get uh, malware, or I want you to give up your information, or here let me send you an email and I want you to uh, transfer a bunch of money to another account, All right? That transferring of money thing is a um, is an interesting case, and, and the reason why I like bringing that up is first of all it works. Right? You send them. You send an email to the right person. Say, "Hey, I need you to, to wire, you know, fifteen thousand dollars to this account. It's for make up some client." Right? And generally, it, well, it's less effective now, but it used to be very, very effective. And the reason it was so effective was because people didn't realize that next to them on their desk, there's this thing. It usually has a cord on it, where they can pick it up and they can dial some some digits, and they can literally call and say, "Hey." Before I wire $15,000, did you send me that email? That is a free thing that solves all these problems, right? It solves all that problem. Um, so really, what I love about this is, this is not a technical fix. This is a process fix, right? I'm gonna send you an email, it's gonna have all the details, and then before you do it, you're gonna pick up the phone and call me to verify that it was me. If that's your process, you bake it in, and that's what you use. So. A lot of those things we can do in small business um, very, very effectively. As you get to a larger organization, processes like this become very cumbersome. But unfortunately, well, at, at that level, they should have other systems in place anyways. Uh, when I was putting these slides together, I literally just got this email. It's from Apple. So they say, they want me to download this PDF uh, and run it. PDFs are actually executable files. They, you open them up, it looks like it's a document. They're actually executable files. A lot of times, one of the big vectors here is we'll put, uh, we, they'll put uh, uh, downloaders in the background. So it doesn't have malware in it, but it's got a little script that runs that downloads malware without you knowing because you just opened up a PDF file. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm repeating for the, for the camera, but so the question is, if you just open the email, you don't open the attachment, usually no, there's no issue there. Um, so, and that's, and that's usually how we find out whether it's phishing or not, right? Um, but usually there's no emails. When you click, when you download something, that's when you start having some, some issues. Um, but this one, of course, it looks all Apple-y, if that's a word. Um, but then you look at the very top, did I circle it? Yeah. So these are those little, those little triggers that we look for. If you, how many people send an email out that says, dear client? Nobody, right? If you have my account, you, you know my name. So you're not gonna send me something that says, dear client. And you look at the top, which is Apple support, but the email's from no reply .apple, or no reply .email .apple .support blah, 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 at whatever that domain is. And that's where it actually came from. So it's just a spoofed email. Um, these things surprisingly work well, not surprisingly, but they work very, very well. The other really big one is DocuSign. DocuSign links, I actually have my own domain that I use with clients where when we do phishing, phishing tests and phishing attacks, um, looks exactly like DocuSign, and you come in, you type in your username and password, and I just got your credentials, right? Um, and we'll talk about a case later on that, which is kind of funny. Internet of Things, uh, we're not seeing so these are all, a lot of these things are, have happened or are conceptual. Uh, the botnets coming out of Internet of Things have been huge. 
uh, where botnet, basically it's some attacker is taking over your home router, or the big one was, uh, I think it's called the Mariah botnet, where uh, they were taking over uh, security cameras and, and network video recorders. And they were turning around and basically having them all just send a whole bunch of data to one site, a distributed denial of service attack, and that one, those sites happen to keep a lot of the internet alive. Um, and they took a lot of those sites offline. Um, that was an issue, of course, all with Internet of Things devices. Um, eavesdropping is something that is a potential risk. Um, you know, again, you're plugging something into the network, you don't really know where it came from. It's a data, data connection into the network, right? Um, and stealing of data, it's not something I think I've actually seen happen. Uh, but, I mean, these things are all very, very uh, uh, important to know about. Because what we have to realize is when we plug something into the network, you just plugged a computer into the network. What did you plug in, right? I don't know, I plugged in this thing, and it says it does stuff, right? So what did you do? You plugged another computer in the network, but we don't really think about it like that. Um, think about the capabilities that your phone has, and think about 10 years ago, the capabilities your desktop computer had, right? Um, it's pretty incredible where we come. These things are computers. And they generally store more data than you know what we had 10 years ago. Uh, application attacks. Again, another thing we see a lot of, this we see a lot in the third party, we see a lot with software development, right? If you develop software and you have never run static code analysis specifically for security against your software, you are in for a, for a heck of a shock when you find out all this, this stuff that you're missing. Very interesting uh, things to do. Uh, there's application penetration tests where you can literally hire a hacker to try to crack your applications, and they are usually very successful. Um, but the app, these application level attacks, um, so that's, that's from one side, that's sort of the server side. The client side of that um, is where we see a lot of really what makes malware work. So if you download a, a malicious PDF file, and you just so happen to have a vulnerable version of Adobe Acrobat installed, guess what? You just played right into the hands of that malware. Maybe that's what the malware actually was waiting for, or maybe that's what allowed it to work. So out-of-date software on your own systems, out-of-date software on servers, is a huge risk area. In small business, we can control that. When it says you, you really need to reboot your computer to apply these updates, you know what? When you're done for the day, let it do its thing, right? Applying the patches and not rebooting uh, sometimes actually doesn't work. So uh, as organizations get bigger, keeping things updated gets to be very difficult. If you can imagine doing updates on you know, 30,000 computers, that's terrifying, right? You, do, you push out one bad patch to all those computers and you take that many offline, that's a bad day. Um, so some remediation activities, some things you can do. Employee education is huge. Doing things like this, like what we're doing here, is, is huge, right? If you walk away from here and you learn to be a little more suspicious before clicking that link, right, then this is a big win, right? But think about the other people in your organization who come to work and they think, number one, I, I wouldn't be in a, a target of the attack anyways, right? I'm just the... Uh, administrative assistant to so-and-so, right? I mean, I just, I handle his schedule, right? Well, well, you do, but he also trusts all the email that comes from you, and by the way, I'm really trying to get to that guy, right? Um, you, trying to make people understand that you may not directly be the target right now, but you are a target is really tough. So things, that kind of the keywords you're looking for there, security awareness training, um, is, 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 the big, is the big buzzword there. Um, you can get, you can download, uh, or you can, you can subscribe to different services that do training for you. Um, you can hire people to do training, all that kind of stuff, but you need to do reoccurring training. You need to keep it going, because people forget. Actually, they don't forget, they just get lazy. They get complacent because I haven't been attacked yet. What they didn't realize was, you haven't been compromised yet. You've been attacked, but you were smart enough to know not to click it. If you get lazy, you may not be smart enough to know not to click it anymore. 
um, encouraging people to not just understand what the attacks look like, but who to report to, right? And this is one of the big problems we see a lot of. If I have a problem on my network, if I have a problem with it, who do I talk to, right? What, what do I tell the IT guy? The IT guy gets and he says, okay, thanks for telling me, right? What, what are the processes? Who do I talk to? Helping the individual users understand what they need to do and what options they have is critical. Passwords, and anybody know what MFA means? It's not as bad as it looks. Multi-factor authentication. Um, passwords are terrible. I hate passwords. Everyone hates passwords. Raise your hand if you love passwords. Um, everyone hates passwords. So one of the big problems, again, you know, we call and you say, hey, give me your username and password. Somebody gives up their password. Well, guess what? I can log in now anywhere. So multi-factor authentication, if you log into your bank and your bank sends you that text message with the six-digit code and you got to put that in, that's multi-factor authentication. Specifically, that's two-factor authentication. You had one factor, it's something you knew, which was your, your username and password. That second factor was something physical, a physical token. If you don't have my phone, so I'll give you a real example. If you don't have my phone, I can give you my username and password for my corporate email and you can't get into it as long as you don't have my phone. Because it's the second factor is that phone. It'll send me a text message on my phone and you'll type in username and passwords all day long. It could be correct, but you still won't get in because you don't have that code off my phone. So when somebody, when what, we would not do this, but when somebody in your organization decides to send their username and password over email to the uh, uh, Nigerian prince scammer, right? Those still exist, by the way, and they're still wildly successful. Um, you know, when they decide to do that, they can't log in. You have to have that second factor. Huge, that would have saved so many people so much money on, on a lot of the data breaches I worked on. Um, it actually would have made them not data breaches. Um, one of the, the best practices that I look at, um, people are starting to come to grips with, different sites will have different limitations on what you can do, but consider using thing, uh, what are called passphrases. So passphrases are not, um, you know, A, B, C, one, four, nine, six, seven, three. Passphrases are, this is my password, period. Okay, don't use that as a passphrase, by the way. <laughs> don't use that. But think about what you just did. If you capitalize every word and it's just, this is my passphrase, period. You have a password this long with a special character at the end, uppercase and lowercase letters, right? That's what most people are asking you to do. And guess what? You'll also remember it. So passphrases um, are becoming more and more adopted in a lot of organizations, uh, but they have to be used. On your, uh, uh, you know, any of the personal sites you use, things like that, start thinking of, pa of, of passphrases, unless you're using something like a, a password manager, things like that. Um, because quite honestly, if you have a 10 character password, with uppercase, lowercase, a number, a special character, a hieroglyphic, a, you know, blood of your firstborn, whatever that, that password complexity criteria is, right, you're gonna forget it, number one, which means you might write it down, or you might have to store it somewhere else, you store it in a text file that you leave on your computer, which is always smart, um, uh, or in, you know, 90 days, your password policy may say you have to reset your password. So now you gotta go come up with something new and you will write it down. Yeah? I noticed that a handful of solutions are starting to use your voice uh, uh, authentication. Mm -hmm. How hard is that to implement? Voice authentication, so, so a lot of the biometric authentication mechanisms um, are actually really difficult to, um, to use reliably. So uh, to, in order to use a lot of those, you have to have pretty expensive client-based hardware, uh, which is difficult. Um, in the case of voice, right, uh, different computers have different microphones with different uh, response rates, so on, right? So it becomes pretty difficult. There's in authentication, there's uh, false acceptance rates and false rejection rates. False rejection rates means I can you know, in the case of voice, I can say, let me in, let me in, let me in all day, and it just does false rejection, and I get knocked out. The bad ones are false acceptance rates. So, um, it, where I say that, and you kind of assume 
that, yeah, it sounds enough like this person, so we'll let them in, right? You can't go all one way or all the other because there's just there's going to be variations. If you use a like fingerprint reader, stuff like that, if your hand is dirty, right, we, we can't do a all, you know, 100% on one end because you'll never be able to log in, right? Or if you cut your finger and you're using your fingerprint, right, we have to be able to, so biometrics are useful, but they're very useful as a, an additional form of authentication, another, another M in the MFA. <coughs> um, so a lot of kind of additional stuff in here about um, processes, really. So making sure software is updated, making sure you're configuring services properly, which means, of course, um, change the default username and password on stuff. You'd be amazed. You'd be amazed how many uh, systems we, we connect to with default username and password. It's the easy stuff. And I know this is, none of this is mind-blowing, right? You might be waiting for the uh, here's the big secret trick, right? This is legitimately how these attacks happen. They're exploiting the weaknesses that are really just complacency, right? Um, software updates, application software controls. So a lot of this is really just talking about when you, uh, you connect to or you connect a, a device, you connect, you add software, whatever it is, make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you know that you have added software so you should take a look and say, well, are there updates for this, right? Um, should I have changed the password on this? Things like that. Detection measures, there's a lot of things. Now, as you, as you get into a larger, as organizations grow, some of this stuff becomes more economical. Some of it becomes more feasible. Every, for most systems, every login, every log out, every click, every you name it, can be tracked. Are you tracking it? Most likely not. And if you are tracking it, how long do you keep that data? So think about this case as a scenario, right? Um, if you are, you know, your attorney, um, and you've got a whole bunch of sensitive client data. You do, you're a patent attorney, right, for Google. You got all this client data. And somebody compromises your email. So they get into your email. All we know is they got into your email. So now we have to do data discovery on all of your email, everything that that person could have accessed, because we know they accessed it, we just know what they did, right? We have to do data discovery, we have to find out what identities have been compromised, what patents have been compromised, what other information may have been compromised, right, across your entire inbox. Um, people have a tendency of leaving mountains of data in their inbox, right? When's the last time you cleaned your inbox, like really? Um, but you found like 10 years of email in your inbox. Well, you have to do data discovery and reporting on all of those in the case of a breach, right? If I can prove through logs, through tracking of data, that the person logged in, they went to the inbox, and they opened four emails before we caught them and we changed the password. All of a sudden, your data discovery went down to four emails, and now we're looking for where else could they have possibly logged in. But you have just reduced your scope. You have maybe put yourself in a position where the information they accessed wasn't sensitive, so you don't consider it a portable breach, right? And you took a lot of it away. So doing event monitoring, events are just things that you're created by computers, created by software. Monitoring that stuff is so, so important, um, especially as organizations grow. There are not a lot of really good solutions in small business. Um, how many people use uh, Office 365? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you this, if you have any pull with Office 365, go into Office 365. Go into, uh, you'll see a link on the side, Security and Compliance Center. And then look for Audit Log Search. When you go there, it gives you a little search, it's a little search box and you can search for things across. You'll notice, unless you've been there, unless you've turned this on, you'll notice it'll say, click here to enable audit logs. Because Microsoft does not enable them by default for you. Yeah, a lot of clients find that out when it's too late and that's, that's kind of a bad day. Um, just make sure you do that. And definitely I would check that with, with any systems you're using where you have sensitive data. Yeah. Google Office 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the question was really kind of the grant. Really, what you're getting at is sort of the granularity of auditing, and really with with Office 365 as well, right? So the question of you know this is really the, what data are you tracking, right? And making sure that well, if I want to know when somebody opened an email. Well, let's make sure, let me open my email and make sure we have an audit log of that, right? Or when I want to know if a file has been deleted and who did it, let's make sure that we're capturing information on file deletes. With Office 365, uh, there is a way to do it. You have to do it through PowerShell. And uh, get with me afterwards, I'll send you, I have a PowerShell script that does that, turns everything on, all the audit logging. Um, I don't pay for their audit log space, so I turn everything on. Um, so. But yeah, that's a good point though. You gotta make sure if you are logging data that you, you're actually logging what you need, right? Otherwise you're storing stuff you may not need. Um, threat monitoring and user reports, things like that. There are a lot of services out there um, that will uh, you know, determine whether you've got risky logins from certain locations. There's another thing Office 365 will do um, through um, the Azure portal if you log into that. You'll, you'll see some of that kind of stuff. Um, if you have a successful login from uh, Columbia, and you don't know anyone in Colombia, but they logged in with this person's username and password, that's probably a good indicator that that password has been compromised and that account has been compromised. So that's the kind of stuff that we, we, we're looking for for detection. Um, detection obviously is, it's like putting up a security camera and looking at it afterwards or looking at it while it's going on. What I really want is I need that, but I need to make sure the front door's locked too, right? And incident response. This is an area that we want to stay out of, right? Incident response, breach response. Um, incident response is essentially where you have a problem. Uh, we have reason to believe that somebody's been in your network or somebody's getting emails from you asking for data so you know something's compromised, something's wrong. Incident response is the process of figuring out the root, triage it first, figure out uh, uh, what's going on and stop it, figure out what happened and then applying corrective action at the end so we don't have that problem again. A uh, lot of stuff, uh, there, there's a lot of different ranges of what, of what incident response is, right? That's more of the forensic side, the incident response and forensic side. Um, but it also includes things like, think about uh, that ransomware uh, example. 300 computers all get locked up with ransomware. Well, to say that's a security incident kind of downplays what that is. Um, but now you gotta get everything back online. Now you're in incident response. If you've got one IT guy and 300 computers all locked up, he was doing his job fine, but now you need help. Now there's no way you're gonna get this all back online within a reasonable amount of time. Incident response has to kick in um, and try to figure that stuff out. Uh, I will tell you this, and I don't, I don't have my, my slide preview up, but uh, I will tell you this. Uh, with incident response, the important thing is to have a plan. You need to know who to reach out to. Um, there are attorneys that specialize in this stuff. Um, uh, uh, I was gonna mention a name, but I'm not going to. But there are attorneys who specialize in this kind of stuff. Find out who they are, right? Take them to coffee and say, hey, um, is this the kind of stuff you do? Should we reach out to you for this kind of thing? Uh, what's the most common incidents that you see, that you handle? Make sure you have that communication, right? Um, and then make sure you have a company or people that you know who can help you with the incident response side. The more you can pre-negotiate that stuff, the cheaper these rates get. Um, incident response rates uh, are somewhere in the neighborhood of about $500 an hour, man hour, for incident response, uh, or person hour rather, sorry. Um, and the attorney's fees are anywhere I've seen between $300 and $700 an hour for the attorney. Um, if you really do have a data breach, if you are certain that regulated data has been exposed, your first call is to the attorney, not to the data breach company or, or anything like that. The first call is to the attorney. And the reason for that is um, you get other protections 
working through the attorney, um, and they can't directly subpoena the, uh, the investigation companies. They have to go through your attorney. So you can control your messaging. Um, kind of a little pro tip there. We get a lot of cases where people will call us directly and we'll, we'll refer them to, we'll say you really need to talk to an attorney. We'll help you, but here's the risk you're taking, right? So something definitely keep in mind. Do you put them on the same? Yes. Yep. What the, what the I really don't know. I really don't know. Um, I have a, a name I'll give you when we're done. But, um, so there's insurance for everything, right? There's insurance for everything. Cybersecurity is no different. Um, you know, is cybersecurity insurance right for you? It is right for you. Um, you can get them, uh, usually uh, you can get it as a small add-on to your, your liability insurance policy. Um, I think for our company, and I do security for a living, right? Our company, it was, it was almost negligible how much it cost to add cybersecurity insurance. Um, like any insurance product, make sure you know what's covered, what's not. There are limitations. Um, a lot of the policies, some of the policies will break down. We give you up to X amount for legal, up to X amount for, bless you, for notifications, up to, and they'll have a whole list. Make sure you read that and just understand it. A lot of them you will find will be very much the same, but make sure you understand that. And the big thing here, um, Okay, so the big thing here is they will send you a questionnaire. There are only a couple companies that really manage the underwriting for cybersecurity insurance. They will send you like a 14 page questionnaire. And if you know everything on that questionnaire and the answers, you should be teaching the stuff. Um, it's, they're, they're very, very difficult questions to answer. My best advice is you answer them honestly you don't lie about it. I have never seen a policy rejected before being signed. I've never seen anybody kick it back and say, no, you're too high of a risk. I have not seen that yet. Um, what I have seen is one of our clients who got up to their maximum of about $3 million and their insurance company has now refused to pay because they lied on their form. So, of course, they didn't know until after the fact, but that's, that's where they are right now, and that's actually a small business um, that was just very, very successful, and uh, they may be out of business here very soon for that and some follow-on attacks that they had. Um, so, you know, at the point of, you know, make sure you answer the questions candidly. If you don't know, leave it blank, right? You don't need to volunteer extra information. If you don't know, leave it blank, um, and if they kick it back to you, they kick it back to you answer the question when they kick it back. Um, so that's my advice there. There's, like I said, there are a lot of different types of policies, a different policy for everything. I'm not really gonna dive into insurance. I am not qualified to sell anyone insurance, nor am I licensed. Um, so kind of leave that up to you and, and your liability company, but I would reach out to whoever does your, manages your liability your insurance and ask them about this. Ask them what their packages are. Ask them what the $50,000 policy is. Because in a lot of cases, you may already be paying for it, right? So, so know what you're paying for. Um, all right. So with that, uh, let me break for just a couple minutes and ask if there's any questions. Any areas that we dove into? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll have to talk about that separately because I you've got kind of a specific case there of when we're done, let's or when we break, let's talk about that. And I'll kinda yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So LastPass is asking about LastPass um, and, and other password vaulting kind of uh, solutions. Um, I use LastPass. So uh, one of the big problems that we've, we've always had, of course, with passwords are you're supposed to use a different password for everything, and then you're not supposed to write them down, and they're supposed to be complex. Right? How do you manage that? Right? The, the fact of the matter is they end up, look under keyboards. Go, go to your office, look under a keyboard somewhere. You'll find a password. You will find passwords. Um, but LastPass uh, and, and these other kind of uh, vaulting solutions allow you to save your password uh, in an encrypted file, essentially. Um, and they store that encrypted file. They don't store your passwords unencrypted. They only store the encrypted file. So it comes down to the, uh, the level of complexity on that password that you encrypt the file with. So that should be your one big, you know, complex password to encrypt that file. And um, you know what? You really don't. There's there's not a lot of good rules around that, right? I've I, honestly I haven't changed mine, in almost forever on that one encrypted vault. So the way LastPass works, and a lot of them work now, is essentially when you log into LastPass, it downloads that encrypted file of all your passwords to your computer. Most times you don't know it, but it does download it into temporary space in your computer. And when you type in the password, it's decrypting it only on your computer, right? So they never store it unencrypted. Um, if you don't use that password anywhere else, you can generally consider it's not really compromised, so. So is there any safety reasons to do that? I'm hesitant to say no, that there's no safety reasons to, to not use LastPass or to use LastPass. Um, or, or any of them, yeah. Well, I, I'm hesitant because there's always an issue, right? Um, but no, I mean, I use it. I know organizations, a lot of very security conscious organizations that also use this stuff. Um, there are commercial products where you can run your own uh, vaulting, password vaulting products, or password vaulting services. Um, it's a very, very common thing to do. You have to do the risk reward on it, right? What's, what's higher risk, using the same password everywhere so you don't forget it, or, uh, you know, keeping all of your passwords encrypted in a vault somewhere behind a really complex password. Usually the latter is going to win out on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are a number of small businesses that you mentioned that are doing uh, mm -hmm. that exposing these vault terms. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recommend they do? Yeah, so, and that's a good question about, yeah, so he's asking about disposing of old equipment, disposing of machinery, or disposing of printers, things like that. A lot of the commercial printers have hard drives in them. They actually store copies of your data. So when you sell the printer or you send it to the, you know, junk it or whatever, you've put data outside there, and it's not encrypted either, right? <coughs> the rule with, with some of that kind of stuff is, number one, if you can pull that hard drive out, you pull the hard drive out. Um, ask the company who's picking it up, help me get the hard drive out, right? Um, if you have no means to safely, uh, uh, you know, clean off the hard drive. Uh, it's a sort of the, it's the low tech method, but it'll get you by. Um, do you have a drill? <laughs> you start drilling holes through the hard drive. Um, unless you are targeted by a nation state that has put a lot of money into getting your data, generally that's gonna be good enough. Um, I know a lot of IT shops that have just stacks of hard drives. Um, there are, uh, if you do, if you use a document shredding company, a lot of them will actually shred hard drives as well, which is terrifying to see, but it's pretty cool. Um, uh, there's, there's several different methods. For computers, download, uh, I forget what the, the name of it is, but there's, you know, look for the hard drive wiping, you know, software, whatever, and it'll wipe the hard drives on a computer before you sell them, stuff like that. Yep. Any other questions? Um, we, we love toys. IT people love toys, security people, we just have different types of toys. Show you a couple things that, uh, that are pretty wonderful. This thing, little device called a land turtle. It looks like a little external, you know, network. You plug this into your computer, it detects as a network adapter. You plug in the, the cable, your, uh, your ethernet cable to the back. Everything's fine and wonderful. What you don't know is as soon as you plug this in, it powered up a computer in here which opened up a remote connection to your network and to your computer from my computer. So pretty cool. So think about um, 
you know, think about the reception desk at your local doctor's office where they have the computer sitting there and you see all the USB stuff plugged in and think how difficult it would be to go like this when you walk up. It's not difficult at all and it does happen. Um, USB is one of those things that uh, I love to hate. I love to hate USB, love to hate these, th these thumb drives. They're great. They're wonderful. USB thumb drives are fantastic. I can move data from here to here. I can also lose the thumb drive, <laughs> right? A lot of these things we can do. Um, the other thing is we can uh, put malware on thumb drives and maybe throw a thumb drive in a parking lot. And maybe you'll pick it up. And maybe you'll put it in a computer. By maybe, I mean it's like 90%. Um, so. Th that happens a lot. So there was a couple interesting studies. Um, they, if you take a, um, a thumb drive with malware on it, and they did these studies where they actually, the malware, malware was basically when you plugged it in and you ran the file, it would just phone home and, said, and say, this user logged in on this machine to this IP address and it sends the data back. They're doing it for, a study, for study purposes. Well, they found that if you drop a bunch of thumb drives in a parking lot, within 24 hours, 80% of them, bless you, 80 of them will be picked up and put into a machine in that building. If that thumb drive has a logo of it on it, of the organization, it was 100%. <laughs> Anybody recognize the little green unclassified sticker on my thumb drive? It's 100% right here. This hasn't failed yet. Um, you can see it's gotten some use. So those things work, right? Um, I do that with permission, of course, by the way. Yeah, if you, if you find a thumb drive, they're just more likely to, yeah, that somebody's gonna put them in. Yeah, to, to put it in their computer, they're even more likely, yeah. So it, it's those little, it's, thanks, those little, little human tricks, right? Um, um, you know, people are, are one of your weakest points in security. And I say one of your weakest points because I'm being really nice. Um, with thumb drives, actually I'll show you this. Again, more toys. So they actually make hardware encrypted thumb drives. So this is one I use. It's got a little keypad on the thumb drive. Um, you have to put in a, I think, I think I've got a six or eight, and I have an eight digit code that I put in on this thumb drive. If you don't have it, it doesn't work, right? Actually, if you don't have it on this particular one, if you plug it in, it'll pop up a, you know, looks like a normal thumb drive. There's a public side, and then there's the unencrypted one that, or the encrypted one that only comes up if you type the password in. So I have a little notice that I put on there that says, if you find this, it's encrypted, send it back to me and I will buy you one. <laughs> Thank goodness I haven't had to use it yet, but, um, or to use that, that little text file yet, but, um, yeah. So are all the USB chargers, I, I, I don't trust them at all. You get them from the hospital, yeah. from the GM, from all these places, they're wearable. I, I feel like they're. Yeah, so the question was about the USB chargers you get from everywhere. Um, they're. Again, you're plugging your computer, you're plugging your phone, you're plugging something into it, right? Um, I have a toy for that. Hold on. So there, that was actually a very, very common attack uh, a couple years ago where people were setting up devices um, that uh, you would plug your phone into and all of a sudden now it, it compromised your phone, hacks your phone, right? So they created these little things. Oh, I don't have it. Ah. Well, now I'm wondering where I put it. Um, the crazy little devices. Ah, here's one. So it's this little guy right here. This is called Porta. I don't know. But the, if you look up pluggable devices, that's what this is. Basically, you plug in your you know, USB cable here, and then this goes into the power source, to any power source. And what it does is it, it physically disconnects the power lines inside here, or the, the data lines in here. So the only thing this will do is allow power to pass through it. No data. These, I think I got these, they were like two for 12 on Amazon. So cool stuff. 
Um, yeah, there's a toy for everything. The good news is I like all the cheaper ones, so. Yeah. Pluggable, P-L-U-G-G-A-B-L-E, pluggable. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that the risk is really that high anymore because uh, it was a big, risk, a big issue with Apple devices and they've since passed, patched Apple so they don't have those issues. Um, if you plug in your, dev your, uh, your Apple device to a computer and it says, uh, this is a new computer, do you want to trust it? And you have to click a little yes, I trust it. That was the patch that fixed that. So when that happened, but, but um, yeah, so fun stuff. There's toys for everything. So talk a little bit about uh, some breach case studies. So this is the kind of stuff that, you know, they're a lot of fun to work on, a lot of fun to talk about. They're not a lot of fun to work on. Um, but I want to kind of walk through some of these. And we're going to go and look at a lot of these, and you realize that most of these are not very complex, right? These are uh, breaches I physically, I actually worked on. Um, of course, anonymize all that stuff. Um, kind of walk you through some of it. So in this particular case, it's an insurance company. They did benefits management, which means they had a lot of healthcare data. Um, COO's email account gets, uh, uh, credentials get phished. So somebody sent her the email. Uh, said, hey, give me your username and password. She sent it. Um, they got into her system. Uh, they set up forwarders for all of her email to exfiltrate the data to uh, Russian uh, email addresses. And uh, they ended up with a breach of, I think in that particular case, yeah, it was 3, 000, over 3,000 individuals. This was a probably six or seven person firm. So they kind of skated out of a lot of this. They had uh, cybersecurity insurance. Um, it kicked in. They took care of a lot of stuff that they, that they needed to. Uh, they lost a bunch of business because of it. Now, what the people who left them didn't realize is that nobody else is much better than they were, but this was a good example of her email cre credentials got fished, got stolen, but because they use the same service for all their file storage, it's the same username and password, it's the same login. Now, that's not necessarily bad, right, to use those services. I actually love that kind of thing. However, the problem here wasn't the services they were using together, it was that they had a uh, user accounts fished and they didn't have, anyone? Two-factor authentication. Had they enabled two-factor authentication, this wouldn't have been an issue. So this is a healthcare practice. So I love this example because my background is IT and security. I spent about almost 15 years working for, as a contractor for the government. And we always had all these ornery rules that nobody wanted to follow. If you're here and you've talked to a government security person and that's why you're here, you know all the ordinary rules. But, um, and one of them was we wanted you to encrypt everything. It's a server, just encrypt it. It's it, it encrypt it. Now, back in the day, that was easier said than done. Now it's a lot easier to, to just encrypt a hard drive. Well, in this particular case, if you've ever, this, they had, they had AC, an AC company come into this healthcare practice. Um, it's a cardiology practice, I think seven doctors, so fairly large for, for medical practice, for a small medical practice. Um, and uh, had to get the AC fixed in their server room. It's a large closet. Um, so somebody got tapped to be the babysitter. So if you don't know what the babysitter is, you're the one who has to do this while the, the maintenance guy is doing the work over there because, you know, they have to be supervised, right? Well, they're doing that. We all, you know, I, don't, I don't blame this person, but while they were doing their work, one of the two people that was working on the AC pulled a hard drive out of one of their servers and walked out the door. So in this particular case, this was actually very interesting. So he was at least smart enough to know, hmm, there were only two of us in there. I'm not gonna try to do something with that because 50-50 shot, they're gonna find me, right? So he sold the hard drive to somebody who then tried to call and extort the, the uh, practice. And it didn't take, as you can imagine, this does not take a, a super sleuth to figure out. There are still only two people that were working on the thing, right? So they caught the guy pretty quickly, but not before the data was stolen, was lost. That becomes a HIPAA breach. Now, this uh, organization only had about 18,000 patients. They had to notify 37,000. Why? They were a product of uh, a lot of acquisition. So they had actually acquired their, um, 
their uh, ER, EMR system, their medical record system, for, during one of their acquisitions. And part of their terms was they don't get all the clients, they only get that subset of clients. Well, what they did is they didn't delete the other client data, they marked it as inactive. So it didn't show up in searches, doesn't show up on dashboards. Well, somebody stole the whole unencrypted hard drive, guess what? We did data discovery across the whole hard drive. So that practice is out of business now. So that was the case, that was massive. I'm legitimately not even sure they had the money to do all the notification they were supposed to. Fortunately for me, I'm not the attorney, that's their job. Um, CPA and, fat, and patent firm, this I love. So I can smile about these now. Um, so this one, somebody who sent a fake DocuSign link, told to log into it, um, and they, it, they logged in, downloaded some malware, uh, also you know, fished their credentials, all that kind of stuff. And as she's trying to log in to, the, to DocuSign, of course it's a fake DocuSign site, and it's not working. So she keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying. It's not working, so she sends it to one of her colleagues. Well, she tries to log in. Log in, it's not working. So then they forwarded it to an email list of their entire staff. Hey, I think this is important. Can you try to log in? <sighs> yeah, and this one, the really bad part about this one was it was like obviously not DocuSign. It was like DocuSign with a Q and one, two, three at the end. It was, it was pretty bad. But, I mean, you, you look at these three case studies. Um, this company right here, I, I, I think actually, they ended up losing their, their clients. Um, they were actually a, uh, one of the big attorneys that was working with uh, Google and Amazon. And they lost patent data. Like, we for sure know that patent data was stolen. So, uh, and actually, funny enough, I think I work for the client now that took their business, but um, unintentionally. But uh, So these things are easy, right? Easy, easy, easy to fix these problems. But in one case, the, the company's out of business. In another case, huge hit to their profitability. Um, and they, I, they're just easy stuff, right? It's all stuff that we talked about today. I like to tell people that, you know, when, when you hear on the news that, uh, you know, Insert name of company was hit by a sophisticated cyber attack. There are two people that came out with the, with the names, with the title sophisticated cyber attack. One is PR and the other is the attorney, right? The IT guy didn't come up with sophisticated cyber attack. <laughs> the IT guy is yelling, why did you click on that link over and over again and nobody's listening. So that's kind of the insight of that. Um, a couple of these case studies, I, I like case studies because we can kind of learn from these, right? We kind of learn you know, how easy it can be. Um, this was a, uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna jump down to, I'm not gonna really go through the, the top two. Those are very, very large organizations, but um, down to the last one there, it's this undisclosed carrier, I call it. It's a, actually a rather large uh, telco. And they had this little issue where somebody was accessing uh, essentially accessing their, their vo voice over IP services, and they were reselling the voice over IP services. Um, and they were generating some significant charges for this company. We went in to try to help them out, this is quite a while back, we were going to try to help them out, and they couldn't even figure out their own network to help us, to help them. They had devices on their network that had been there for so long and hadn't been updated in so long, they didn't even have the passwords for them anymore. So we're talking core routing devices that you don't just reset and change the password. We're talking, you know, th this is a long-term thing. But these kinds of things happen, right? And that stuff is, that's, that's like a growing pains kind of thing. We were talking earlier, um, one of the, the things that we, we work with a lot are small companies that are growing. They're in a growth phase, right? So uh, you'll have a, you know, your, your own, you have your little office in Winter Park, and now you're gonna have, you're getting too big, and you know what? We're gonna open up an office in New York. What does that mean? It doesn't mean let's go on Dell.com, buy a bunch of machines, and uh, where do I sign the lease, right? There's more to think about. When you, when you start expanding your business and you try to expand really, really quickly, you really have to keep an eye on IT. You have to keep an eye on all that. 
So if you don't, and then things get very, very messy. So how many people have heard of uh, Mossack Fonseca or the Panama Papers? All right. So this one is actually pretty large. This is one of the largest uh, uh, law firms, I believe, in the world. Um, they held, and I've got my statistics here somewhere. Hold on a second. See if I can hit my, ah, there we go. Hold on. We'll get back to your regularly scheduled program in a moment. Um, 11 and a half million files, multiple, ter multiple, multiple terabytes of data. Um, do I have my mouse? Did I lose? There we go. The numbers are kind of impressive, right? 2.6 terabytes of data stolen. At the time, it was the largest data breach. It was only a few years back. Over 300,000 companies, 143 politicians, 12 national leaders, and a $2 billion paper trail leading to Vladimir Putin. Mm. Right? So interesting. Is that it? I can't see from here. Yeah, it was. So how did this happen? Right, because this came out, and this is a sophisticated cyber attack. Right, this is this is scary and dangerous. Remember what I told you about that phrase, right? So it kind of was a, a two phases. And we'll walk through this, and you'll see what it what it is. So they had a, a web server set up, a WordPress website. Anybody use WordPress? I do. It's okay. It's okay. Hold on. Um, and it was using a um, a known vulnerable module, a known vulnerable plugin, called Revolution Slider. So Revolution Slider at the time had been known to have issues, um, and it was found pretty easily by a script, and somebody logged in, and they gained access to their website. Well, that doesn't do a whole lot for you. You get access to the website. But their website was sending data back through email. So in order to send emails, they were, had their website connected to their mail server. So they had credentials for their mail server and their website. So when I have your credentials, what do I do? I don't need to be the, there anymore. I'll just go right to the mail server. So they start exfiltrating files. They start downloading all sorts of mail, right? So far, what we've seen is out-of-date software sitting on the internet and the username and passwords right in front of us, right? That's the vector right there. So now they've got about a bunch of that information, but they don't have all their files. So what else did they have? They had a Drupal web portal that was set up way out of date with many critical vulnerabilities. They were able to use some of the same credentials. Um, they were able to log in and just start downloading everything that company had. This is not difficult. Like this stuff is, this is like 101 kind of stuff of how to hack, right? I think, pretty sure they said sophisticated attack, but uh, you know, you be the judge of that. But that's how easy some of this stuff can be. And this is probably the most complicated one we'll talk about, right? So uh, there are still lawsuits pending on a lot of the data that was found. There are um, legal actions against a lot of people. Mossack Fonseca was, uh, for lack of better, more correct terms, a front for a lot of organizations uh, to sh shelter, off shelter money offshore, to launder money through different organizations that the law firm was setting up for them, things like that. So a lot of personal information. Yeah. 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 That was it. So update your stuff, guys. Um, so and they and and we don't really know that they were actually targeted, right? There's some speculation that they may have been targeted, but yeah, it, usually that's not the case. So what happened there? You know, security misconfiguration. You know, we like to look for security baselines or configuration baselines. When you install a computer in your organization, is it the same as the last computer you installed? Right? So uh, does everyone use the same kinds of software on the same versions? Usually not. Right? Are the same security patches applied? Usually not. And what happens is we allow that to go on for so long, it gets so far out of whack that we don't know what normal looks like anymore for that computer. That becomes problematic, right? Um, do you audit systems regularly, or do you even have a way to audit those systems? So there are some tools out there that you can use that, that'll help you with this kind of stuff. But if you do have a configuration baseline of some sort, how would you know something changed? 
right? These are, these are kind of hard questions. There are a lot of, uh, you know, for everything we talk about, there will be a product you could buy for everything. Um, when we talk about in the next section, we're going to talk about risk management and where a lot of this applies. And we're going to try to dig into that a little bit deeper and what you should really be doing as a small business. Um, yeah. And then, of course, who has access to what data and how is it protected? Uh, the third party problems. And this we saw uh, with one of the, the, the companies. But, uh, you know, do you know if your third parties are secure? Um, if you're in legal services, there's a lot of uh, third party you know, legal applications you use. You store all of your data for your client and your client's behalf on those systems. Have you ever asked them about their security? Right? And, and you have to ask them more than that, right? Because if you say, hey, are you guys secure? Well, of course we are. Yeah. Um, you know, what data do you share? What data do you share with them? Do you know what data you share with them? Because a lot of times you don't. Did it integrate with your email? Whatever system you're using, does that integrate with your email? Well, what do they save? What do they keep? Right? There was an issue with uh, one of these uh, free services a while back that would automatically, bless you, automatically unsubscribe you from a whole bunch of mailing lists. Right? Well, you also connected them to your email. They were harvesting your email to build a profile on you so they could target ads for you. That was how they were making their money. What did they do with the email after they read it? I don't know. Right? So if you're in a regulated industry, these are things to be very concerned about. So auditing of third parties is something that's a little bit difficult. Um, when you ask somebody, are you secure? Don't be afraid. Remember, you're the customer, right? Don't be afraid to say, how secure are you? You know, do you have any certifications to show you're secure? What are you doing for security? You know, ask those probing questions because it is your data. It is your interest, right? Um, if they really have their stuff together, they already have answers for you. If you're using the major providers uh, or major cloud service providers, they usually have that stuff for you online, right? It's when you start getting the very specific one-off kind of software or the very niche industry-specific software where you really have to keep your eye open and you have to kind of keep track of that kind of stuff. Um, if you use, if you're in healthcare and you use Dropbox, for example, you can log into Dropbox and you go in your admin center and you can download right there, one click, what they call their BAA, their Business Associate Agreement, which you have to have with everyone um, in healthcare. And it's right there for you. It tells you what they do for security. It tells you what they're responsible for, what they do, right? So very interesting. And it's, it's always easy enough just to ask the questions. And if they don't have a good answer for you, you'll know pretty quickly. Um, you know, have they been breached already? It's not always the greatest indicator. Um, a lot of services have been breached. And I guess to some degree, kudos to them for actually letting us know they were breached. But it's, it's good to know. Because if somebody says, yeah, we've been breached, and say, well, what did you do? Well, what did you do to recover from that breach? And is that going to happen again? They will tell you no. But ask those probing questions, especially, like I said, I'm not, I'm not suggesting you call Microsoft and ask them these questions, because you can get that stuff online. And, the person you're able to get a hold of at Microsoft doesn't know the answers anyways. But um, you know, for those industry-specific uh, uh, kind of applications, it's important to ask. If you save your source code somewhere in a third party, you need to find out about their security, right? Things like that. Mismanagement, um, you know, and this, this is going to apply more to larger organizations or as you grow. Have you taken security seriously from a management perspective to begin with? Right? Um, for most people, that answer is no. And uh, you know, do you have a formal security team? Right? We, it's not uncommon for us to go talk to a, a, a client that's got 200 employees. They got one IT guy. And he's also the person that fixes the squeaky door in the back. Um, there is a, a cockroach problem over there, so we had to go take care of that. Right? It's the same guy. Um, and, and I tell people all the time, you know, it's with IT, everyone knows when their email goes down. If your email goes down for 30 seconds, you are answering the phone for three hours explaining why your email went down. If your network's insecure and you haven't been, a, haven't been breached, no one knows. The phone doesn't ring. So which do you naturally prioritize? So you have to actually really focus on managing security and making it part of your process, making it part of your, your organization. 
Um, do you have policies and procedures in place? I'm trying to hit time here, so. Um, you know, what would you do if you had a breach? Would you know? Would you know if you had a breach, right? <laughs> um, and are you practicing risk management in IT? Risk management we're gonna talk about in that third section. Um, and it's very, very important. You can spend a ton of money on security. You can spend a ton of money. Uh, one of the uh, group we worked with a while back had uh, this, this really, really great thumb drive system. Now don't laugh, don't laugh based on my previous thumb drive comments, but they had a check-in and check-out process for thumb drives. They had physical tags they inventoried. Data was encrypted before it went on the thumb drive, and it was deleted when it got back. They had a very specific reason that they needed to transfer data on thumb drives. Um, it was beautiful. And then you find out that uh, the rest of their network has been totally misconfigured, and you could actually get to all those files anyways, you just didn't need the thumb drive, right? They spent all this time, all this effort on securing a thumb drive, and they never stopped and took a step back and said, you know, is that the most important thing we need to be doing right now? So, lessons learned, right? So seek out best practices. Um, you know, begin practicing a security risk management program, right? And, and that starts really with sort of a risk assessment of understanding, you know, what, what is critical in my environment and how am I protecting it, right? Um, working across all domains, not just IT, right? When you realize that um, so much of security is in processes, right? The idea where you're never going to stop, you are never going to get all phishing attempts out of your email. It's not going to happen. People are still going to try phishing attacks. But if you take a simple step like telling, um, you know, the people who do acquisitions in another department, look, pick up the phone and verify that number before you make a transfer, right? Those little things matter, but you have to be willing and able to work across those different boundaries. Um, establishing baseline security standards. What is, what is the bare minimum that we do for security on these machines? So we might run some scripts that do some configuration for us, we might, uh, if you have a domain controller for Windows domain controller, they might all be added to that and they all get the same group policy. Um, you might have antivirus, you might have all this other stuff, right? But what is it, right? What is it? Because we need to make sure we know what that is so when we go back and look for it later, we know what we're looking for. Um, have a plan, seek help where you need it. This is the biggest thing. Uh, people will get uh, these little minor compromises. Right, where maybe it's a, you know, I lost a password somewhere or something like that. And they don't seek out help. Seeking out help does sometimes have a price tag, of course, right? But um, if the longer you let it go on, the worse it gets. So make sure you have a plan, make sure you know who you're talking to, make sure you know who you're calling. Usually it's probably gonna be, if, it's, if you really believe it's a breach, it's probably gonna be the attorney, um, which of course is, is money, right? But uh, you know, have that plan in place. Very, very important. And, yeah? When you say you seek out the attorney and do that first, don't you expect that the attorney will do the work? So you explain what the problem you're having, mm -hmm. right? Um, that you believe that email was compromised. And they'll ask you all the, the right questions. You know, do you have, is it possible that you have personally identifiable information on the email? And then you say, I don't know what that is. And they will explain to you very specifically legal definition of what that means, and you can have that conversation, um, and they'll tell you pretty quickly whether they think you should proceed with, with investigation, or whether we just say it's a notification kind of thing, or, or what you should do, right? So a lot of that stuff, you know, if you're, if you're more tech savvy, or you're more, you're, you kind of get a little bit more, you can figure a lot of that stuff out yourself. Um, but where, where that, now, that knowledge gap is, you know, the, the, the small price tag you might pay up front is, may save you in the end. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into the third section here, um, assuming, assuming my phone's right. Is it 3 o'clock? Okay. All right. I don't trust technology. I don't know. All righty. So now we're going to jump into the third part, cybersecurity compliance and risk management. So I wanted to make sure we touched on risk management because, again, you got to apply, you've only got so many hours in the day, you've only got so many dollars in the budget, right? Most people for security have zero dollars in the budget, right? Now, when you have a data breach, that budget gets really big. All of a sudden, you've allocated everything, 
give it like three, four months, and the budget goes away again. This is what happens. So <coughs> cybersecurity management is risk management. It's risk management for IT. Um, there are a lot of frameworks out there that you can follow. This is the NIST cybersecurity framework. It's important to notice that a lot of these things are not step-by-step -step processes. These are frameworks that are meant to be applied across your entire organization, okay? You will get tons of great information from NIST, um, tons of great information out there on how to secure your networks and all that kind of stuff, but understand that a lot of these are not step-by-step -step processes. Part of the reason for that is people make money off of telling you the step-by-step -step process, to be real honest with you. That's number one. The other part is it's not always the same for everyone. Right, you have a everyone has a different risk threshold. Everyone has a different budget to work within, right? Or if you have regulated data or you don't have regulated data, you're using cloud services or you're not, right? There's a lot of those variabilities um, that make some of this a little bit harder to just put on off slide, right? So what are you trying to get out of cybersecurity risk management? You know, what, what are your biggest areas of risk? That's a tough one to figure out. That's risk assessment, right? Um, Based on those areas of risk, what could you do to mitigate those? What could you do to help prevent those areas from becoming a real problem? Uh, cost benefit analysis on everything. So this is traditional risk management kind of stuff, right? Um, and then what's the cost of doing nothing, right? And that is kind of a, that is a really important question. While I, from a, from a security background, I want to tell you to do everything under the sun, right? But sometimes that doesn't make sense. Right, sometimes the risk does not justify the cost of the implementation for a service or something like that, right? That's stuff you have to kind of figure out. And what, figuring it out is in terms of, if I do nothing, what does that cost me? Anywhere from zero to maybe your entire company, right? So uh, NIST 800-30 is something I, I'm very, very familiar with. But this is, if you've ever seen a risk charts, they all look relatively the same. They all look generally like this. 800-30 um, is a security risk assessment methodology. I would recommend taking a look at that. Um, it will kind of walk you through, uh, you know, the, the areas of, or how to develop a risk assessment and what you're sort of looking for. What it doesn't tell you, it doesn't really take you the next, the next step of what are your risk areas, right? So let's think of some risk areas. I don't know if, yeah, I didn't have that in the slide. So the risk areas, um, they advocate, and I agree with the, what's uh, what do they call it, like a threat-centric model or an attacker-centric model, where what we want to do is we want to look at what can an attacker do, and if they did that, what would they have access to, right? So average organization, um, an attacker might send an email and try to uh, fish your credentials, right? That's a threat. It's an external adversarial threat. Um, and what can we do to prevent that? Right, so two-factor authentication would be very, very helpful. Um, uh, training, security awareness training would be very, very helpful. And that's good, but what are we doing now? Right, what do we do now? What could we be doing? And where does that fall? What's the likelihood, if you had to guess from very low to very high, what is the likelihood that an attacker is going to try to fish your credentials? Anyone? Very high. If it hasn't happened while you're sitting here, I'd be surprised. Okay? Very, very high. Well, if it's very, very high, what is the likelihood, based on the controls that you have in place, that it will actually succeed? Now, those controls in place could be how much knowledge do you have about it? How savvy are you at determining whether or not, you know, Something's going to happen, right? Um, for an individual, after, after today's session, right, you would probably say it's somewhere in the moderate phase, right, in the moderate area, because we're all going to go enable two-factor authentication, right? We all know what to look for, and we all know the attackers are trying to, trying to get us, so we're much more aware right now. When you take that and you multiply it by 50, 60, 70 people, right, now what is the likelihood that it's going to be successful? Well, if I have two-factor authentication enabled, it's still pretty low. But if I don't enable two-factor, it doesn't matter how much I try to train everyone, someone's going to get hit, right? Someone's going to click the link. Someone's going to reply with their username and password. It will happen. So based on that, we come up with our level of risk. And at the end of the day, we can sort those out. So 
like I say, you know, we find in a lot of cases, people will say, I'm really, really, really nervous that this system over here that has all of my uh, medical records on it, I'm really nervous somebody's gonna get into this system. And my question for them is always, do you take medical information over email? When was the last time you changed your email password? And, and usually there's a, there's a lot of, uh, oh, I, um, you know, I change it. No, you didn't. Um, did you, do you have two-factor enabled? No. Do you use that same username and password for everything? Yeah, probably. Guess what's a higher risk right now? Your email. You come in totally concerned about this box over here in the corner that's not even connected to the internet, right? Yet the email is actually where he needs to be focusing, he or she needs to be focusing their time, right? Being able to walk through that is very, very critical. It'll save you a lot of money too, by the way. Um, I, I don't have all the, the risk management charts in here, but the idea that there are some things we can, there are some things we ignore, there are some things we remediate, there are some things that we, uh, we write off with insurance, right? So, and that's gonna have to be based on your risk, your risk threshold, based on budget. So, kind of jump into compliance here. So, security versus compliance. Security is primarily concerned with three areas. Uh, and it's the CIA or the AIC triad. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is this document secret, it needs to stay secret, right? I don't want people to see that. We do that through encryption. We do that through uh, just controlling of data, right? Controlling who has access to it. Data integrity uh, is, you know, if the data is entered into the system now, it needs to be the same when I come back, right? That's one area of integrity. Um, and availability are the systems online and available when I need them. So with availability, you end up crossing between security and IT in a lot of cases, right? Um, if, the, if the network goes down, can I still access the system, right? Well, maybe I need redundant networks, right? Depending on what it is, you kind of cross that. Compliance is intended, how, how uh, beneficial, or not beneficial, but how, how uh, uh, good it is at its, its role is a different issue, but it's intended to make sure you're following the rules it's intended to make sure you are developing secure systems, right? So there are tons of compliance metrics out there depending on what industry you're in. Um, and then you'd be surprised at some of the industries that have no compliance metrics at all, interestingly. So if you have really strong security, going from really strong security to compliant security, there is still work to be done. You will always have things to do. There will be, you know, you did, I guarantee you did not document your network the way that every compliance metric wants you to document your network, stuff like that. Um, but really it comes back to all this together, that thing we started with, right? What are your critical assets? You have to know this in order to do security or compliance. What is critical? Where is it at? How is it protected? So lots of legal frameworks. No, we're not, gonna die. we're not gonna dig on all these, right? But um, healthcare, financial services, uh, credit unions under financial services as well. Um, if you have a public company, there's Sarbanes-Oxley, there's all sorts of other stuff. Um, anybody do work uh, with EU or any uh, European companies? Yep, are you familiar with GDPR? Yeah, so GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation. This is a new thing that, uh, it's in, in, if we're working with uh, anyone in Europe, or if you employ European uh, uh, residents, you have to be GDPR compliant. The regulations or the, the fines behind that are incredibly stiff, and the regulations are very murky, right? So anyone, this is still one of those things that um, we're trying to help clients get through some of that, and it's still very, very difficult, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, it was mentioning it's not just, you know, the continent, right? It's the European uh, countries. So, but yeah, and it's, and it's, it's kind of messy. 
Um, but all of these are just different frameworks. All of these, if you have really strong security and privacy behind you, you should be okay. We should be able to figure out, you know, what's the difference between, well, the regulation wants it written like this. We have it written like this. Okay, we'll make it fit the regulation, right? Um, Unfortunately, we find in most cases, people are so far off on security, we're not really even to the point where we can start talking about compliance in a lot of cases. Um, one of the ones I, I wanna point out, I think it's very uh, important for all of us here, is the Florida Information Protection Act. This is uh, state law, uh, requires you, any business entity in, in the state, uh, to take reasonable measures to protect and secure data in electronic form what does reasonable mean? I don't know. Um, reasonable ma measures. Um, and if you have a breach of 500 or more individuals uh, of their personally identifiable information, um, you have to notify the state and you have to notify the individuals. Uh, the tricky part here comes in where 48 states have data breach protection laws. They're all different. They're all generally the same but they all define what is PII, what is personally identifiable information, a little bit differently. Because why make this easy, right? Um, in Florida, if you have first and last name and either a social security number, a financial account number, government ID, uh, could be any government ID number, um, or any health information or insurance ID number, that is considered personally identifiable information. If you have somebody's username and password in plain text, that is personally identifiable information. If it's encrypted, it's not. So if you have their security questions, that can actually be personally identifiable information, right? So something to note, in Florida, uh, your date of birth is not personally identifiable information. It is not restricted, it is not private. If anyone tries to prove their identity to you because they know your birthday, which a lot of people think is a private thing, it is not protected in the state of Florida. So uh, kind of something to remember, but that's why it's actually not up there either. So this is one of those cases where uh, in a couple of those breaches we had, um, you know, the attorneys were, were working on this stuff and they had clients in eight different states, right? Now you've got eight different, uh, uh, you know, regulations that you have to follow. Yeah, it gets pretty messy. Usually they're all generally the same though. Right? Usually you can come up with that common denominator, you go with, the, you go with the, most, the most ornery one of the bunch, and then you follow that one. Um, so uh, other states, 48 other states, excluding Alabama and South Dakota. Uh, Guam has data breach protection laws, but Alabama and South Dakota do not. Um, so there's, it's, it's, it's a huge scope for that. So, Wanted to dive into a little bit of that NIST 800-171 compliance. How many folks are doing government contracting left in the room? A couple folks? Okay, so we're gonna kinda go through some of this. I think it's very interesting and this would be a good case study on uh, compliance in general. Um, so uh, the Department of Defense uh, for actually for many, many years required that government contractors who had what's called controlled and classified information are required to follow certain security guidelines. And the security guidelines were largely unfollowed by most defense contractors. Well, recently, uh, instead of it being at the DFAR level, it was now put at the FAR, so at the Federal Acquisition Regulations, um, which includes the DFAR, uh, where you have to follow a whole bunch of rules. They came up with a specification, or NIST came up with a specification, the 800-171, and that's what they want you to follow, right? So this is for, uh, any non-federal organization holding CUI data. 22 categories of controlled and classified information. So you might be, you'll be very unsurprised to see some of these things, but you might be surprised to see a few more. So one of those things, if you have a source code that you're developing for the government, that is controlled and classified information, right? If you have technical documentation, that is CUI. If you have, um, procurement information or acquisition information to include things like a proposal that you wrote for the government. That is controlled and classified information. Source selection, all that stuff is all controlled, right? So they want you to obviously take care of a lot of this stuff and, and, 
and uh, protect it. There are some of those areas, like I said, that uh, you know, make a lot of sense. So uh, information system vulnerability data. So if you have uh, IT people that, and this, is, this was largely my role, you know, if you have IT people that do security or IT for the government, right, all the data that they generate about vulnerabilities and the research on that network, that is controlled and unclassified information, and co controlled but unclassified. So what that means is when it's on my laptop, right, I was working for my contractor, we had our own security standard. When it's on my laptop, we have to be 800-171 compliant. So a lot of that stuff is, it makes sense, but this is stuff that has never really been enforced. It's now starting to be enforced. Um, this was one, so the controlled technical information, I wanted to dive into this a little bit. So research and engineering data, data uh, engineering drawings, manuals, standards, uh, computer software, executable code and source code, uh, studies, analysis, related information. If you do any work for the government, you're generating some of this, right? Or you have access to some of it. So uh, 14 different families of controls and we'll send out, I'll have, uh, send out some information later. I have an Excel spreadsheet I can send you guys. You can actually see it all broken down. It's a lot more, a lot easier to read. Um, but access control, media protection, um, awareness and training. So where it becomes really difficult here is when we start talking about uh, you know, very small organizations, two, three, three person organizations, right? You have to comply with the hundred and something controls underneath those 14 families. It's literally this documentation here, right? Um, I think it's 109 controls or something like that. Um, some of them are, are not, the, the tough part is looking through and finding out which ones are not applicable to your organization. Which ones um, can you say maybe, I don't, we could do X, Y, and Z, but we're a three person organization. I could literally see the other people I'm not worried about badge access, for example, right? We're small enough, we have a compensating control, and that compensating control is that we are that small, right? It's just kind of an example. There are areas where you can kind of get around some of that stuff. Um, things like awareness and training. You don't need a big massive awareness and training program for a smaller company, but you need to make sure we know the resources, we're gonna make sure we all at least watch this video, right? And we're gonna make sure we track it every year. Yep, this is when we did it. Yep, we checked it off, right? So we can get through a lot of that stuff pretty easily, uh, but it does get kind of challenging when you start scoping down to the size of an organization. Um, this is an example of one of the controls. So, and this is the awareness and training one. So ensure that managers, system administrators, and users of organizational information systems are made aware of security risks associated with their activities the, uh, and of the applicable policies, standards, and procedures related to the security. Blah, 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 blah. This says make sure they know what they're, that everything we've talked about, right? Make sure they know what's important, make sure they know what their responsibilities are. Um, and how do we do that? We can do security awareness training. Um, they also advocate uh, of using uh, role-based training. Uh, one of the things I really, really liked about the government and how things work were, uh, in IT, you didn't just have an IT role, you always had a, a security role as well. Right, so to administer a, you know, a network switch, you had to have some baseline training, but you also had to have training for that device or training for that series of devices to be certified to actually to, uh, administer those things. So if you had somebody who had a bunch of security training, they're IT, um, but they've never uh, administered or managed um, you know, Active Directory Domain Controller. Are they qualified to administer the Active Directory Domain Controller? Of course not. So this idea of sort of a role-based training where these, these issues, these vulnerabilities, these problems um, really only relate to the IT staff and they should have that training. So role-based training is, is very important. There are uh, training solutions out there that'll do a lot of this stuff for you too, um, but really that becomes kind of important as you become a larger organization. Um, in there you'll see the 800-171, you'll see all of this kind of stuff in the end, and you'll see a reference to eight, NIST Special Paper 800-53. This is something you will see in a lot 
of security frameworks. You'll see it in non-governmental security frameworks. You'll see it everywhere because NIST came up with what's called the 800-53. It is a large document, and if you want to learn how to secure a system, you can start reading through that. Um, it is not fun. It will put you to sleep pretty quickly, um, and then that's your starting point, right? And then we go other places from there. So, um, but in the 800-171, which is where a lot of which is where we're, we're focusing on here. They actually will point out, here's the mapping, the 800-53. They actually do, here's a mapping to ISO IEC 27001, which is great. Um, but they don't require you follow specifically the 800-53. So you can come up with compensating controls that reasonably mitigate the risk for all of these things. Um, another example here, so access control. Limiting information, ac limiting access to only authorized users. Uh, so it's kind of a, kind of a no-brainer, right? Let's limit access to only people who should have access to it. Well, we say that, but how many people have? Don't raise your hand. How many people have the, uh, you know, the big file share that everyone in the organization has access to? Right? How many people control very closely what gets uploaded and downloaded from that file share? Not very often, right? So you end up with these huge, over, overly permissive systems that if you can imagine going into an organization and having to pull back privileges, that is painful. That is painful. Try to take somebody's administrator access away from them on their own computer. That's not a fun day. That's how you make enemies. Um, but that's kind of stuff that, that, we, that we think about that we have to do. Um, so next steps for 800-171, uh, you know, download and read the 800-171. It's actually not complicated. It doesn't, it doesn't read as dry as you would think it is. Um, and then planning for implementations, and then implementing controls like a project, right? And I do want to touch on, on what I mean when I say that, right? <coughs> is when we implement controls, we don't implement controls on one system, right? We don't implement controls just for the IT department. We implement controls for the entire organization. And that's where uh, you know, security and IT people really have to start becoming uh, friendly with other areas in their own organization because you will have things like, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. So uh, everybody walks in and out, they're all friendly and everything, but uh, of, of a secure door and you hold the door for the person behind you, right? Did you look and see if they had a badge? No. If somebody's walking past your desk and they don't have a badge, what do you do? Do you stop them or do you let them go, right? If you stop them, what do you say? What do you do, right? We have to implement those controls. That's an access control, not just for IT, that's access control for everything, but it applies to IT because that person who's not supposed to be in the building may walk right into the server room, right? Or they may, it may not be that difficult, they may walk over and just grab a stack of papers off the desk and walk out. We've seen that happen. So having to work across the entire organization can be challenging, but you have to implement that in sort of a, a very uh, project-oriented framework. That's how it works for, for me mostly anyways. Like the after hours crew. Yeah, so the, up yeah, the after hours cleaning crew is, is definitely a concern. And actually, you know, it's funny is you, you don't have issues as often as you would think, right? You would think, it'd be, you would think it would be an issue, but um, there are most of these, these uh, crews actually do all their background checks and you know, that's part of their sales pitches. We make sure, all that kind of stuff. But still it's on you, right? When you have sensitive information, it's locked in a desk drawer. Um, went to a, a company that does a lot of healthcare work and you know, they had their, their HIPAA cubicle. And literally there's paper stacked over the top of the cubicle. And he's had a heart attack, like, oh my God. Um, so, so that's a privacy and security concern, right? Um, and account, of course, they, they have a cleaning crew and they would never know if somebody took anything. So it's both sides. It's definitely both sides. Um, so I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about a couple of the other frameworks that you may have heard of, right? Uh, HIPAA is, of course, a big one. HIPAA has security and privacy rules. HIPAA is, um, I don't think I put the slide on there, did I? No, I didn't. All right. 
I talk faster than I plan to. So HIPAA has the security and privacy rules. They are pretty easy to find online. They are um, not so easy to figure out how to implement, right? HIPAA, if you actually go through and you start reading the rules for the HIPAA security, uh, HIPAA security rule. So I mean, here's, here's all the rules for HIPAA security. I put, it on, I put it on two pages, and there's a lot more data in here than, than needs to be. Um, you would be surprised, maybe not, to know how many doctors, how many people who handle medical records can't do this, right? Um, HIPAA, it's, it's, you know, why, why do we want somebody's medical information? Why does an attacker want your medical information? Yeah, so a couple, couple good things, right? So number one, uh, insurance fraud. Uh, fraudulent billing. Number two, if I have that information, I don't, I don't need your username and password anymore. I've got all of your medical history. I know who, it's, you know, I like to tell people, it's really hard to change your mother's maiden name, right? And guess what, that happened to be your security question for another site, yeah. right? So this me medical data becomes an absolute gold mine. Uh, there's a lot of privacy concerns there too with, um, when you get into, I'm trying to think the delicate way to say some of this, right? When, when you get into uh, uh, reproductive issues, we'll say, um, a lot of that stuff becomes very, very sensitive, right? Um, the exposure of some of those, some of these, some of these uh, medical records could just devastate people, right? So it's it's very, very important. And when you hear issues where, um, you know, major healthcare provider oops, lost eight boxes of medical records, right? That's a big deal, right? And, and the uh, Office of Civil Rights usually will pursue that kind of stuff and they'll get massive judgments out of it. They have to go through like the, the PII data breach reporting stuff. You get your, you know, your free year of credit monitoring. I really hope those credit monitoring years stack because if so, I am set. Um, but I'm sure they don't. But uh, you know that's you know how much good does that provide, right? But you know, and you look in HIPAA, and HIPAA requires one of the big things HIPAA requires is security risk assessment, and one of the big things they ask you for is if you have an issue is your security risk assessment, because they want to know no one's going to be perfect, but they want to know that you've at least taken the first step to know, all right, this is my big area of risk, and I should probably take care of that. Uh, one of the things that we do with, with clients that we'll ask them, uh, you know, do you have a security risk assessment? They all say yes. They had to check a box that they did their security risk assessment so they could take Medicare Medicaid payments. So they all say yes. And then you ask them, well, what's your, what's your top three areas of risk? And they can't answer. I'm just asking for three areas, guys. But they can't answer. And when you finally really nail them down, they'll tell you, well, you know, we, we should really have screensaver locks. That's not an area of risk, right? What are your big areas of risk? And they can't answer those questions. Um, almost every single risk assessment I have ever reviewed for another, for another organization doesn't use risk past the cover page. It says risk on the cover page, and then you'll have a chart like this where they're just red light, green light, right? Yep, we're good, and that's what they do. Um, that's obviously problematic. But you'll see that in, in, in a lot of these control environments is that unless they're being actively audited, they slip and we lose track of, of what, we're, what we're trying to do. Um, does anyone take uh, credit card payments? A couple folks? Okay. So if you take credit card payments, uh, if you've ever heard of the PCI Council, the payment card industry, um, that is one of the toughest uh, requirement, like regulatory frameworks to, to adhere to. Uh, they get, and it's also one of the most expensive too, by the way, but they get very, very detailed on very specific things. And they range everywhere from the easy common sense stuff, like change the default passwords on your firewalls. Now the fact that they actually have to put that in the control is, is interesting to begin with, but um, they're, they can get very, very complicated. So one of the big things there, that, and, and we had talked earlier, is about scoping. 
properly scoping where your data is, properly scoping your environment. If you have medical information, if you have credit card information, if you have uh, PII, you have all this kind of, right, does it need to be accessible by the entire network? Does it need to be accessible by all your staff? Can I take all of my credit card functions and just do them all on one computer? And then only allow one person access to that one computer and segment it off the network completely? Can I do that? Because what you have now done is you have taken your scope from I have to apply PCI to my entire organization to one machine, right? So we gotta kind of think about that kind of, think about uh, compliance in terms of scope. Um, it'll save you a lot of time, it'll save you a lot of headache, and it'll save you a lot of money, too. Um, so with that, we kind of skipped our breaks, and we got a little bit ahead here, but I want to open it up for, for any questions. I know we, we went over a ton of stuff today, um, and if we want to get more specific on some areas, let's, let's do it. Good question. So she's asking, um, you know, you have to have somebody else do repairs and stuff like that on your computer. What credentialing do you look for? Unfortunately, um, it's it's difficult to, to say. There's Security Plus. There's CISSP credential. There's um, several of those that that'll give you a good idea that they know what security means, um, but it isn't necessarily guaranteed that they're going to do things securely, right? I always have issue with. Uh, you know, having a, a third party kind of work on a, on a computer ever, but sometimes that's what you have to do, right? So, yeah. Um, basically, employees sometimes are the weakest link. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have an agreement and what kind of agreement do you have with each employee and what mm -hmm. type of product? Yeah, so asking about uh, employee agreements. So the term is, and this, this is the Google search, you can find these, you can find templates all over the place. It's called the acceptable use policy, the AUP. Um, the acceptable use policy is the agreement between the employee and the employer that this is what's allowed on this network, this is what you're allowed to do, this is what you're not allowed to do, um, and then a lot of the control uh, frameworks will also specify you have to have, I forget what the phrase is now, but you have to have a, um, the thing in there, the, uh, oh, I forgot to tip my tongue, but you have to have the, the language in there that says can include, you know, up to a termination if you break this policy, right? The thing I'll say about acceptable use policies is understand that people will sometimes accidentally break the policy. Um, so you have to make sure it's concise enough that they can understand it, they're gonna actually use it. Um, but it's not too concise and too shortcut where it doesn't actually protect you. The other thing is that, um, you know, the employees, your employees have to realize that they are on your network using your devices. They do not have an expectation of privacy. There are some things that they might have an expectation of privacy, there are some weird legal, there's some case law in there, but in general, they don't have any expectation of privacy when they're using your resources in your, in your facilities. So um, we don't necessarily have to drive that point home too hard with folks, because then they start getting paranoid. They start asking a lot of questions. Um, but the idea of, of kind of you leave it open for in the future, if you need to do full, you know, forensic packet capture or something like that, or you have, or you buy this new tool that's gonna do a lot of really deep searching, you've already got that taken care of in your, in your AUP, in your employee agreement, so. Question, yeah. Yeah, so the question was about GDPR, kind of dive into a little bit deeper. <laughs> so GDPR, if you do any work with uh, European uh, citizens, you have to be GDPR, GDPR compliant. Um, kind of one of the first steps you look at in GDPR is, uh, and this is, this is almost back to my little three-step chart of the, the who, what, where, when, why, how, that's more than three, um, is called a ROPA, it's a record of processing activities, I believe. And what they're looking for on that is, what processes do you use that could be, it's a system, it could be a, you know, an intake process for an, for an employee. What process do you use that involves the privacy data with a person? Who is the owner 
of that process, right? Who, uh, how are you controlling the, the data flow? Do you send that data elsewhere? Things like that. I always encourage people to, you can download, or I can send you one, uh, the ROPA templates. You know, there's a template, it's a little Excel spreadsheet kind of thing. And going through those processes. And what you end up finding out is that GDPR, like a lot of things, applies to a lot more than you think. Um, you know, it's, it's, if you, so a lot of interesting industries that kind of fall under this. Uh, anything to do with immigration is, of course, huge. Uh, if you do uh, travel, right, if it's a travel agency and you manage travel for uh, European residents, or European citizens, rather. Uh, if you uh, are a doctor's office, if you're a nonprofit, if you are, it doesn't matter what it is, if you're working with European citizens, uh, you have to adhere to those, those regulations. Now, GDPR, it's very important to know, GDPR is not a US regulation. GDPR is an EU regulation. So they only have so much leverage, right? Um, but they can fine you, and if you have locations in Europe, they can, they can make life pretty difficult. No fines have happened yet, of course. It's very, very new. Um, unfortunately, a lot of GDPR is in a lot of ways open to interpretation, and which, which is why I mentioned earlier, it's kind of murky, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of navigating through it. You can go online, you can find 75 presentations on GDPR, and they'll all tell you different controls, all, th all tell you different things, which is rather concerning. My guess, and this is just my guess, is within the next six to nine months, there will probably be some more technical kind of guidance coming out of GDPR um, because organizations all over the place are kind of flailing and you know we don't really know where to go. You can read GDPR, you can read through all the rules, you can make a spreadsheet, you can do the whole thing, um, but you know it's still open to a lot of interpretation right now, unfortunately. So, but definitely start with that ROPA, the ROPA. I would contact under the advisement of the attorney. Yeah, um, it, it's so trying to protect. Right. Yeah. I mean, and, and trying to protect. So, so part of the reason why you want to go through it for like a disgruntled employee, for example, right? Um, part of the reason you want to go through the attorney is if you want to take this to court. Now we have to keep chain of custody. You know, this data now that now that we've captured the data, who captured it? Can you guarantee it hasn't been changed since it was captured? Who had, you know, ownership of it while it was a lot of those interesting things that you kind of want to work through the attorney on. Yeah, yeah. What kind of uh, files can you receive that can be malware? What kind of files can you receive that could be malware? Um, a lot of them, actually. <laughs> uh, really, it's it, assume all of them, and then back down from there. Um, so photos, usually there were some kind of edge case scenarios where um, you could manipulate a photo to a certain way and certain um, you know, photo viewing software, it would trigger a bug. Very much an edge case scenario. Um, we don't really worry about photos. What we really see mostly are we're looking at PDFs that are coming in. Um, if you ever get a Word document, Excel file or something like that, and you open it up and it says click here to enable macros, Right, a macro is a piece of software that's running in the back end. And Microsoft, the newer versions of, of Office, actually for a long time now, will warn you first. So if you just kind of blindly say, eh, it's, yes, it's like, like you do with the iTunes user agreement, right? Just, yes. Um, but if you uh, uh, just blindly click yes on that, you're allowing something to run. I don't know what, but you're allowing something to run. It is a very rare case when you see an organization legitimately use macros in anything that they would mail out. So I know um, it used to be anyways. So I think it's funny enough, I, I think, well, I'm not gonna say that. <laughs> but uh, one of the organizations I work with, I believe their timesheets are all in Excel spreadsheet and they have macros enabled. So in that case, I, I actually trust the source, but I still don't enable macros, I just do all my data, so. But yeah. Mm -hmm. SVGs, yep. Yep. 
it's a whole bunch of lines, uh, ve vectors, right? So yeah, no, that's, that's a good point, yep. Um, It really depends on the industry. It depends on um, so much of, it, it depends on industry, it depends on uh, any regulatory compliance you have. It depends on how big you are. Uh, if you're using you know, cloud services or you're self-hosting a lot of stuff, um, it, it's, it can range. It's really hard to throw a range out there for that. Um, yeah, it, it's, I'm just really hesitant to throw a range out there. It, is the fact that you would think that there should be a budget is a win in my book, right? Because um, we're, we're getting to the point now where uh, most people just don't, um, they don't even budget, they don't, they don't consider it, and they'll actually consider it as part of IT budget, right? What we end up doing in a lot of cases is we go and we, we talk to the IT guy, and a lot of the stuff we recommend, the IT person in a lot of cases already said, but they hear it from a third party and all of a sudden they want to do it, right? Um, so things like, you know, when, when the IT guy says, hey, uh, my firewall really needs to be, you know, th this thing's like 11 years old. I don't think it's latest technology anymore. Um, you know, you have to consider hardware, you have to consider software. It's, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to bundle it all together and even, even give a baseline. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Uh, usually should be okay. So that's about cutting and pasting and, into an email. Usually should be okay. Um, if you can, paste as plain text because you can actually inadvertently copy scripts out too. But yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, if you had the opportunity between like a server-based software and a cloud thing, what would you choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the option between server-based and cloud-based and, and from a security standpoint. From an operation standpoint, most of the time it makes sense just to go with the cloud-based with, with current solutions, current offerings. From a security standpoint, um, more often than not, it's more secure to have the third party handle it for you. Unless, unless you have an IT team and a security team that is going to manage that server and that software and apply all the updates every week as they're required and all that stuff for you. If you can do that, if it's part of your normal workflow, then you're, you're usually gonna be better off locally hosting it yourself, um, assuming you have the resources for it, right? But uh, with outsourcing, again, kind of going back to that third, part, that, that third party issue, um, asking about security, so. Yeah, yeah. There is, well, the news. Um, other than the news? Um, oh, goodness, I'm trying to think. So there's a lot, of good, a lot of good resources out there. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Um, one, of my, one of my favorites, and it's actually kind of, you really kind of have to be into it, I guess, but um, is there's the, uh, it's called the SANS Storm, Stormcast, S-A-N-S Stormcast. It's about five minutes every morning. That's all it is. It's five minutes about security. Here's the latest things that are happening. Um, and it's based on a bunch of data that came out from the previous day. We've been doing that for many, many, many years. SANS is a very reputable organization. Uh, SANS.org has a bunch of, uh, of information for you, too. Um, there is, if you're looking for things like, you know, I have a bunch of Windows machines, how do I secure them, right? Look at uh, CIS, so the Center for Inform Information Security, Internet Security, CIS. So CIS.org, um, they have tons of what they call their benchmarks. And the benchmarks are a lot of these guides. You, know, you have Windows 10. Here's all the things we recommend you do to secure Windows 10. Um, the, uh, <coughs> another uh, resource for that is uh, it's actually a government resource from DISA, from DISA, from DISA, called the STIGS, the Security Technical Implementation Guides, S-T-I-G. The nice thing about the STIGs um, is they will cover, cover other applications, other things that CIS does not. 
um, and they kind of vice versa as well. But there is a full STIG, is what they call these big, it's analogous to the benchmarks. There's a full STIG for Microsoft Office. So you take Microsoft Office out of the box and there's like 85 you know, security controls they recommend you apply, right? They never, they didn't put them on originally, but you know. So um, that uh, I would recommend, uh, you know, the, a lot of the local organizations, like I said, um, the uh, ISSA, Information Systems Security Association, um, we do, with that organization, we do monthly meetings. They're all educational meetings. Um, the happy hours aren't as educational, but the meetings are. Uh, well, they are, there's different kind of education, but um, uh, there's, uh, like I said, uh, Security B-Sides, B-Sides Orlando, um, is actually a lot of fun. By the way, it, it's, if, if you're looking for something to do that Saturday, it's a lot of fun. Um, but it's, and it's also extremely educational. You'll see uh, uh, what a lot of these, you know, high school and college students are doing. Um, that are that will blow your mind. In addition to a lot of the professionals I got, um, trying to think of anything else kind of offhand. That's those are kind of the big ones. But yeah, it's enough to it's enough to keep you going. Yeah, yeah. So any other questions? Yeah. So, oh good, this is on video. Um, so uh, he's asked about the cyber camp and, and uh, you know, kind of what that entails, right? So um, we focus on defensive security, which means locking down machines, uh, applying controls, a lot of stuff that we talked about today, but really tactical, how do you actually do them? We will do things like we'll give them infected machines and say, okay, well, what's wrong with this? Right, figure it out, fix it. Um, and we score them based on how much they fix and how much they do. We actually do, and I don't think we're doing it this year, but we have an offensive security track where we're teaching ethical hacking. So that's the, that's the proper term for it, but it's ethical hacking, um, where you have your, uh, your rules of engagement, you have, your, uh, you have permission, and your scope, and you stay within your scope, and you try to figure out if you can get into these systems. Um, and, and we do have a track on that. I don't think we're doing it this year, though. Um, so we're, we're trying to bundle it all together with that high-level knowledge. The, the first part of this presentation, um, you know, section one, I actually delivered to these students as well, a, a version of it to these students. Um, and it's, it's really trying to get people to understand that cybersecurity is everything. And then with these students, getting them to actually figure out what it means in, in a real-world context. Yeah, we're not training little hackers, but, you know. But, I mean, you, you could take this into school situations, mm -hmm. I mean, even into elementary school. I mean, Absolutely. So there is another organization. So ISC Squared um, is one of the, it's the largest uh, security uh, association, like professional association in the world, isc2.org. Um, they, uh, they have a program called Safe and Secure Online. And through Safe and Secure Online, they actually have a number of what are called the Safe and Secure uh, Mentors. I think they call them mentors. I'm one of them, I don't remember what they're called. Um, but they're instructors that'll come out, and uh, I have delivered the, the, their presentation, uh, and it's all about privacy and security online, um, to students as young as fifth grade. And you wanna talk about interesting, talk to a bunch of fifth graders and ask them what they know about, about computers. Oh, um, I like to tell people, I, I, we, we do that for, you know, that's another organization, but I'm, I, I try to help where I can, right? Um, and I like to tell them, you know, they, uh, my, my reward out of that is the stories the kids give me. The things that if mom and dad knew you said that, <laughs> they would be rather upset. Um, one of my favorite questions that I love to ask as we talk about with the students that age, right, we'll talk about, uh, you know, you should only be friends with people online that you're actually friends with, right? You know, you go to somebody's Facebook profile or whatever, and they've got, you know, 1,100 friends. It's like, you don't even know 1,100 people. And, uh, you know, so only be, you know, friends with people you're really friends with. 
and we start asking some questions. I'll ask him, should you be friends with your teacher on Facebook? And the teachers are always sitting in the back of the classroom. They're just doing their thing, and they go. <laughs> and I tell them, no. Your teachers have enough, enough to deal with, with you in school. Um, and then they go. <sighs> but yeah, so they have a uh, sort of their, their general program they originally created. They have a parent's version of that program as well. And they have a senior's version of the program, which is another huge, huge sector that we, haven't really, we didn't really talk about. Yeah. All right. Yeah, ISC2. ISC2.org, yep. And they're actually based out of uh, Clearwater, I believe. So. <laughs> no comment. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all so much. I'll be hanging around here for a little while longer if you have any other questions you want to talk. Um, but thank you so much, and, and it's a wonderful time. Thank you.